Hi, welcome to the second episode of Talking Shop, a podcast for trade union activists. Today we're going to be talking about the UCU, National Pension Strike, and the internal debacle that's followed it. Um, today we're joined by Jess Meacham, who is Vice President of the Sheffield Union Branch, um, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, some of the things that happened during the strike, the things that happened at conference, and obviously what people's plans are for the future as far as uh, spreading democracy and activism inside of the UCU. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone to introduce themselves so you know who you're joined by. Uh, I'll start with myself. My name's Dave Pike. I'm an official for the National Education Union and a long-time IWW member. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm a teacher, teacher of history in Workshop, and I'm an IWW member and also a dual carder in NEU, National Education Union. Um, I'm Lydia. I'm an admin worker. Uh, I'm a member of the London branch of the IWW and I'm the women's officer for the branch. And I'm Jess. I work in student support at the University of Sheffield and uh, as Dave said, I'm from Sheffield UCU branch. Great. Thank you for joining us, Jess. My pleasure. Uh, Pass over to Lydia for the first section of the uh, podcast. Cool. So, um, if you could give us a bit of background about um, what started the dispute, what what happened with the pensions, what was proposed, um, which kind of instigated the the dispute. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'm going to start with a bit of a disclaimer, which is that pensions are really, really complicated, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of maths involved. Um, and I am not an expert on pensions by any means, so I'm going to give you a very broad overview of what the proposed changes to the pensions were. Uh, so the, the pension scheme that, that UCU is in dispute about is called the USS scheme, which is the University's Superannuation Scheme. Um, and the scheme's been in existence for a long time, um, and it's largely been the same for a long time, and it's largely been a pretty good deal for UCU members. Up until fairly recently, there's been, there were some big changes to the scheme in 2011 um, and the changes that the employers wanted to bring in that caused the most recent dispute um, were really, I think, a step too far. And the, the major change that they wanted to make was a shift from what's called a defined benefit uh, pension to a defined contribution pension. Um, and what that means is with a defined benefit pension, you know what you're going to get at the end of it when you retire. With a defined contribution pension, that's much less clear. Um, and you know what you're going to pay in, but you don't have a guarantee of what you're going to get out. And there's all sorts of uh, complicated maths uh, to do with how that plays out and to do with how the scheme is valued um, and things like that. But but UCU calculated that the changes that the employers wanted to make would leave the average university lecturer £10,000 a year worse off in retirement. Um, And that was a red line uh, for the union and for the members. So um, the scheme is slightly complicated because it wasn't all of the universities uh, in the UK who were going on strike. There are about 130 universities um, across the country and there are about 68 of them that are in the USS scheme. And those universities are the older universities uh, in the country. They're the ones who were established before 1992. The post-1992 universities, so the universities that used to be polytechnics, are in a, a pension scheme called the Teachers' Pension Scheme, which is an entirely separate scheme. So when we talk about it being a national higher education strike, it was to an extent, in as much as there were universities all over the country who were on strike, but um, it, there were 64 universities uh, who were involved in the dispute, and it was those older ones uh, who were in the USS scheme. Um, and we have been negotiating with Universities UK, who represent the employers for years on this, obviously. Um, <laughs> and the, the dispute came to a head last year, primarily over a contested valuation of the scheme. So Universities UK and, and USS put forward a couple of valuations and UCU is blessed with a lot of economists and pensions experts and mathematicians among our members. <laughs> um, and they all had a look at the figures and said, hold on a second, we're not so sure about this. Um, and one of the really fascinating things about the dispute from my point of view is that a lot of the members who were involved in publicising that were lay members. Uh, they were people who were sometimes active in their branch, sometimes not, uh, but they weren't uh, from the union leadership necessarily. And there are a couple of people in particular who really got stuck in on trying to pull out what is often very 
opaque information about pensions and tried to make them accessible to the membership. And I think that was a sort of a key thing uh, in the dispute. So that's the background. Brilliant. That was really clear. Thank you. Um, so I guess the next thing really is what happened during the dispute? Um, you know, what kind of action did people take? Um, you know, how long did it go on for? That kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. So, so this was, um, I think it would be fair to say, the first substantial strike that ECU has ever been involved in. We have a less than glorious history of uh, impactful strikes. Memorably, once, or possibly even more than once, uh, some two-hour strikes in the past. <laughs> um, so, so the USS dispute was the first time that we'd gone on strike for a very long time, and it was 14 days of action in the end uh, that was spread out over four weeks um, so it was an interesting pattern of strike days and we started balloting for that before Christmas last year um, and then I think, I can't remember the precise dates now, but I think by the end of January we knew what the strike dates were um, and we were sort of building to that throughout last autumn really, um, get the vote out campaigns happening in the branches, um, various sort of planning going on um, ahead of the, the strikes actually happening and then during the strike itself, I think um, I think it would be fair to say again that not only was the strike bigger in terms of the number of days that we were planning to be out, but it was bigger in terms of the number of people on the pickets. Mm -hmm. It was bigger in terms of the incredible support that we had from students, um, certainly in Sheffield, but across the country. Uh, there was just some really remarkable student activism going on alongside our pickets. Um, so it was it was really quite a transformational thing I think um, and I think that was widely recognized and widely sort of celebrated and publicized by members at the time um, there was all sorts of um, I guess creative ways of going on strike happening um, we had we we had we had student activists in Sheffield doing what they called a roving picket where they would just go around all of our different picket lines because it's a campus university so we had pickets on sort of 10 different buildings and they would go around and they'd chant and whatever and one day they decided to mix it up and have the raving picket <laughs> so they publicized it in advance and they had the music the 80s the neon um and a lot of our members really got on board with that and there was lots of fancy dress there was lots of dancing there was poetry there was singing um and all of that was really really great particularly because the first couple of weeks of the strike the weather was horrific and we were trying to pick it in sort of feet of snow and it was it was really really deeply unpleasant it was um, doing the beast wasn't it yeah yeah yeah, from the east. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah i remember trying to get to school on those days yeah very difficult <laughs> yeah i mean doing anything on those days was really difficult yeah. so the fact that we had people out at seven o'clock in the morning you know in those conditions was uh was pretty remarkable really there was a phd student in my department who somehow managed to get over the pennines on public transport to pick it oh, um, wow. and i was just i was dead impressed mm -hmm. you know um that's brownie points forever that, yeah. that is amazing. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. solid comrade <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um so yeah i think and and loads of branches around the country were doing sort of exciting stuff leeds um that leeds is a great branch and they they were doing um strike up your life instead of spice up your life and spice <laughs> and putting it all over social media and just there's a, a real good humored um element to it all which i think is actually compensation for the fact that oh my god we're going on strike for 14 days we've never done this before mm, it's actually yeah. terrifying how can we sort of you know um build a sense of solidarity and community out of that um and i think the other thing uh that was or is exciting about strikes in higher education um, are the sort of events that go on alongside which are often called teach outs so you have um, you know academics activists politicians uh, students coming together in spaces that aren't formal learning spaces to talk about the kinds of things uh, that we might talk about in the lecture theatre but then again we might not um, we had some fantastic teach out sessions at Sheffield um, some really really great ones some that were very much based on people's research some that were more sort of uh, creative and wide-ranging and activism based um, but what was really unusual about them were the kinds of conversations that people were having in those sessions the, the sort of formality and hierarchies of the relationship between staff and students at the institution really broke down during those sessions in a really mm. positive way uh, so those were really great as well 
Did, did you um did you find it personally surprising the response the the, the strength of response because you said that and you know I've I've worked well it was a long time ago but I did used to work at, at Sheffield University um, several years ago and I had similar comparable experiences of UCU that very reluctant to go on strike very reluctant to organise do you get did you were you surprised by this response and do you have a sense of where it came from. Yeah, so I, I think there's kind of two things there. The, 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 the fact that we went out for so long, the fact that we were going out on a sustained period of strike action is to do with uh, shifts uh, within the sort of activist layer of the union towards the left, shifts on the National Executive Committee towards the left, that kind of thing. So that's sort of a longer term thing. Um, and then in terms of the actual strike itself, yeah, I was blown away <laughs> by how many people were on the picket line, which is not to say that I didn't think people were going to go on strike. I did. But I didn't know that they were going to do it so visibly and so mm. creatively and so openly and that they were going to talk about it in very direct, explicit terms on social media. Um, you know, there, there didn't seem to be any fear of being victimised or any, any concern about that. You know, it was, it was straight up, we're doing this. There's a sense of... A lot of us are doing it. Confidence. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Complete confidence, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I think that's a really interesting point because that was one thing I wanted to ask about actually anyway was <clears throat> where the shift had come from to move to a 14-day strike because, you know, I, I think it's it's one thing to look at that, that one point and go, oh, yeah, that was great. But actually what's always important is looking back over the few years, you know, dark times or whatever, of those few years before of all those people who've stuck around who've kept putting the work in you know who have really worked hard to drag an organisation to left and that's not just talking about UCU you know we've seen similar things happen inside the Labour Party yeah. you know where people just look at Corbyn now and go oh yeah there's been a big shift to the left but that didn't come out of the blue that came out of people sticking at it and working really hard for a number of years to drag it gradually kicking and screaming to the left. I mean, would that match up with your experience in UCU? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, I think that's completely right. Someone that I work quite closely with, mm. you know, in the middle of the strike, sort of almost broke down. You know, we, we've done this incredible strike. They are never going to have me out for two hours again. <laughs> um, you know, which is absolutely people who have put years and years and years into, um, into trying to get that kind of national strategy. Uh, which made the ending of the dispute, I guess, even more more difficult, I, I suppose, for, for some of those people. Mm. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it's a long-term project. It's a long-term thing. Um, there's no quick and easy way to shift a union leadership that is essentially conservative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it has to be a slow process of, of building things up, changing policy, changing, changing networks mm. and branches, I yeah. think, yeah. Mm. I saw a lot of people referring to... Um, referring to the the dispute as a kind of make or break moment for UCU um I, I guess because of um how disappointed people had been with um with leadership and how things had gone um disputes in the past did you get a sense of did you get a sense from people that there was a kind of that there was a sense of urgency about this you know partly to do with kind of the future of UCU rather than just around the specific dispute yeah, I think so. Although I think probably that that sense comes from people who have spent a lot of time thinking about the union, probably mm -hmm. rather than the, the the elements of the membership who um, who will vote and who will you know occasionally come to a meeting but don't spend their time gripped by it. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think not to sort of blow the trumpet of my own dispute or anything, but I think it was it was transformational for staff in those institutions, regardless of whether or not they were UCU members. Um, just because uh, all the grievances that people have had with working conditions in higher education got wrapped up in the pensions dispute and people started talking about marketisation, they started talking about workload, they started talking about stress, they, you know, everything that we've been campaigning on, casualisation, um, for years and years and years, this has been again a slow process of building it up um, and lots of teach out sessions would focus on those things lots of talk on social media blog posts all of that kind of thing so it became a sort of a wider conversation about the problems with that part of the sector i think yeah um to move it from a kind of from the positive to you know maybe slightly uh um 
slightly more de- negative aspect, I guess we need to talk about the um, how the dispute ended, um, like how people feel about how it ended. Um, yeah, if you can fill us in a bit around that. Yeah, so so there were kind of two uh, two crisis points during the dispute. Um, and the first one uh, is the one that, that's, that's happier to talk about. There was, there was an initial deal that was agreed between uh, UCU negotiators and U- Universities UK that was mediated by ACAS. Um, and it, it was a deal that was better than what had been previously offered, uh, but it still wasn't great. And there was a bit at the bottom in the sort of, uh, not the detail about the pensions, but in the detail about how we were gonna go forward that said that UCU was going to strongly recommend that staff rescheduled teaching loss during the strike. Um, and that, that deal was kind of made public in the middle of the dispute and it was absolutely roundly rejected by the membership, kind of overnight almost. Um, and the meeting that we held uh, at Sheffield to talk about that deal offer um 350 people turned out on no notice uh which is just the most <laughs> amazing thing really um and it was all very last minute and nobody would had any sleep and the motion had all sorts of grammatical errors in it but um, <laughs> but you know not enough whereas and stuff like <laughs> yeah but um and then so so branch reps then went went down to ucu head office and just basically said to the leadership no we're not having this um, so they went back um, and t- talked again. Um, ACAS weren't involved again after that point. Um, and by the time the final day of strike action came around, there was something else and another um, another offer, which was the establishment of a joint expert panel, um, which I guess was agreed. It, it, it had factored into the previous. Uh, deal but it was it was the center of of this final one Um, and I think the idea was to kind of appease the uh, the lay element of the membership who'd been going you know hard in on their spreadsheets and say you know you'll have the opportunity to feed in we're going to talk about the valuation we're going to talk about the numbers and we'll do it together uh, in this joint expert panel Um, and then there was another meeting held with branch representatives um, and the leadership sort of, you know, said, here's, here's where we are, here's what we want. Um, and sort of from there, everything has been disputed, basically. That that meeting itself was held at the very end of March. Um, and the interpretation of what happened in that meeting that came out of UCU head office is quite different to the interpretation that's uh, been circulated by some of the branch activists. Um, there's various sort of conflicting tallies of who was in favour and who wasn't in favour and um, it's all it's all been quite complicated but but the the end result of that was that that they decided to put it to a ballot Um, and at that point a majority um, and quite an overwhelming majority admittedly of the membership um, voted to accept that and and suspend the industrial action Uh, so that's what happened. Did that come with a recommendation? Yes Um, well not explicitly a recommendation um, certainly not a recommendation that was voted on by anyone, um, but it, you know the, the emails that came out uh, from Sally Hunt, the general secretary, uh, were were very sort of clear that 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 they felt that this was the best we were mm. going to get at that time. Um, Sheffield's line on that was: "We absolutely do not think you should vote for this. We think this is nonsense. We think, you know, we we, we had momentum, we had great action going on. You should reject." Um, we ha- we weren't able to get a breakdown of the uh, ballot results by branch, although I did ask for it, uh, which is a shame because I would have been interested to see how Sheffield members mm. voted specifically. Um, but yeah, it was about two thirds to a third uh, to accept. So and that's where we are now. Um, the joint expert panel has met several times. Um, it has released reports that say very little um, uh, the, so so what's actually happening is is you know quite um, it's happening separate to what the membership is being told about I think mm. although there's still an incredible amount of work going on by the membership uh, to uh, submit to the panel um, and to submit um, to send those submissions elsewhere as well and to make them public so that people can talk about them so. it's, it's interesting that you highlight 
the majority vote because I think this is often a method that trade unions with historically very low participation will use to legitimise what the leadership is doing because the way the strike wasn't being conducted it's not like that was not democratic it's in many ways a different form of democracy isn't it it's much more participatory a tick box with a yes or no is a different model of democracy so you have in a way a very participatory model clashing with a highly representational very flattened model of democracy the end result is I guess they come out saying well our membership has mm -hmm. approved of our decision but really that's not telling the full story is it of what's going on I think that's absolutely right yeah I think um, I think there was a general sense among uh, among the UCU members that I, knew, that I was talking to that as soon as it went to a ballot it was likely to be accepted mm. um, for, for precisely that reason that the, I guess that the participatory layer of the membership is, is smaller although it's substantial it's a substantial minority in UCU I think um, very substantial in terms of in terms of the activists who were at Congress which we're going to talk about in a minute but yeah I think, I think you're right there are two different models of um, two different models going on there yeah um, I think that's why talking to you today fits so well after our last discussion um, because for me that um, differential between organising and mobilising is so well, well represented with mm -hmm. what happened during the strike because what you had is you had activists on the ground you had branches doing actual organising you know all that stuff you were talking about about making every strike every every picket line as participatory as possible doing stuff that's creative and interesting and, and allowing members to come up with their own ideas and run with them compared to what the leadership was doing which was as Chris quite rightly said ticking a box which was just well we've got the vote out that's enough you know job mm. done you know and, and, and it does for me really represent that um, that difference between the two I don't know because I, I mean I know we spoke earlier in that you'd listened to the previous podcast did you see any similarities in there in those discussions yeah absolutely I think um, I think the, the difference between organising and mobilising as you outlined it in episode one is absolutely key to, to what's happened in UCU I think um, I think probably um, probably what happened certainly uh, at Sheffield or in my experience of what happened at Sheffield was I thought I was mobilising but it actually was a form of organising like, I, I don't think I was necessarily clear on the distinction at that point um, but thinking about it afterwards and thinking about it in terms of um, Jane McAlevey's definitions mm -hmm. yeah certainly um, certainly that's what's happened is, is UCU is great at resources for branches that are you know here is your get out the vote strategy mm -hmm. it's a pdf go go forth and do it <laughs> um, um and and that's you know that's fine and up to a point it works you know it, it talks mm -hmm. about face to face and door knocking and you know all the good stuff mm -hmm. um but it needs to go further and and the membership now having been through that dispute and um you know the different networks that are springing up and the different conversations that are being had as a result of it i think it's going to be very difficult for them to go back um, well, obviously, mm. <laughs> so mm. exciting times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that uh, segues nicely into a uh, section where I was going to talk about um, UCU conference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, just as a way of introduction, uh, we're at a little bit here just to uh, get the conversation started. So, uh, uh, we're really aware there's a lot of people that may not have had much of a contact with with the UCU disputes. I thought I'd just introduce it briefly. So, during UCU's 2018 conference back in May, directly following on from their dispute, it became very clear that the vast majority of delegates wanted to have a very serious chat with Sally Hunt, UCU's General Secretary. <laughs> got a diplomatic way. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a very right. diplomatic guy. A serious chat. A serious chat with Sally Hunt. That sounds like a lovely evening. <laughs> um, with... Uh, and in that particular case, all but 20 of the delegates present uh, waiting at conference uh, wanted a no confidence motion to be tabled and discussed. Um, I really liked the Times higher education headline that described how uh, Hunt had clung to power because UCU staffers had refused to let two motions uh, be discussed. 
the now infamous motions 10 and 11 <laughs> uh, calling for a resignation um, they argued that it would be circumnavigating their rights as staff to be disciplined under the organisation's staff policies um, they even produced a letter from their own branch of Unite uh, which represents UCU staff um, stating as much uh, following this the staff including the general secretary then walked out of the conference uh, refused to allow it to continue uh, they were joined by a small group of delegates who supported them, mainly focused around Communist Party members and Newcastle branch of UCU, um, who felt that they had the ear of the General Secretary. That's probably a nice way of putting it. Um, I think it was particularly good. I don't think many people have seen this, but the Newcastle branch of UCU have even produced an extremely cringeworthy video um, of them... Uh, reciting a rendition of Rudyard Rudyard Kipling's If uh, referring to her leadership stating that those that have chosen not to hear in time they will appreciate you oh my god we're going to have to put that link in the article (laughs) that's so embarrassing it's only had 25 views (laughs) we can change that let's make it viral let's make it viral make it viral (laughs) <laughs> we really should <laughs> um, despite this limited support it is crystal clear that uh, Sally Hunt is hugely alienated from the grassroots of UCU uh, and there's no real constituency outside of the Communist Party I think it's fair to say oh and of course not forgetting the uh, Morningstar newspaper a, a newspaper beyond reproach <laughs> of course um, definitely going to get a letter about that <laughs> um and uh, we need to ask why this happened. I mean, ha- it's, it's amazing to have a general secretary leading one of the biggest national disputes in recent times in the UCU, yet still ending that dispute, becoming massively disconnected with her own membership. Uh, for this thing, it's worth looking at what happened at the conference itself, but also internal dynamics in UCU, which allowed this to happen. So I think it's important to look at Sally Hunt and... Um, She's never been a member of UCU. She's never a lecturer, as far as I know. Um, she's been a, a, a trade union official, a career trade union official. Um, and UCU is, in fact, in the UK, um, quite rare in that it's one of the few unions that allows non-members to become the general secretary. Um, this meant that she's worked her way up in the internal structures. And yes, she won an election, but she hasn't been challenged for some time. Um, not in any meaningful way anyway Um, and a number of years ago a similar situation happened in the NAHT uh, which is the National Association of Head Teachers um, where a similar uh, situation arose there was a staff member was placed on the ballot by their national executive and all but appointed to the throne however as soon as the as an actual head teacher stood for the role he thrashed the house can the in-house candidate um, and there's been similar stories in other unions. I know in the NUT a number of years ago, a member of staff stood for general secretary, um, even though they'd actually been an NUT member years and years previously. Um, but uh, the reality is um, they, 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 didn't manage, they didn't get much of a vote. Um, so we also need to understand why there haven't been a lot of lay candidates coming forward, why there hasn't been, because you know, I think it is fair to say that UCU has a lot of internal politics but that hasn't that hasn't reproduced candidates to go with that. So I think it's worth having having a discussion about that. So um, first of all, do you think you could talk us through the conference, how that infamous motions came to close the UCU 2018 conference? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to go back very briefly mm-hmm. to the video you mentioned. Um, <laughs> it, it will be very important for uh, Newcastle University UCU that they are not held responsible for this. It's Newcastle College um, oh, who okay. produced oh, the video. Um, Newcastle University, <laughs> I am very sorry. <laughs> Apologise um, intensely. But yeah, I mean, the worst video I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> one of. Um, so yeah, UCU Congress. Um, it was It was an interesting experience. Um, when when we got there, we were, uh, I wouldn't quite say picketed, but there were people standing outside giving us leaflets from Unite uh, that said, um, you know, what, what you've just described, um, that, that a series of motions that were actually, it wasn't just motions 10 and 11, there were another two as well, 
um, that that the staff members of UCU didn't didn't believe that that those motions were acceptable to discuss at Congress, um, and that there would be walkouts if they were to be discussed, um, and. One of the motions that was contentious was a motion that Sheffield had uh, submitted calling for a democracy review uh, of the union, which we'd <laughs> called for in the light of how the dispute had ended, thought that would be a, a constructive, positive way forward for UCU. Um, and we'd, we'd received uh, notice in advance that it hadn't been put onto the main agenda uh, because the committee who decides what should go on to uh, the order of business uh, thought that it was critical of, of staff members because there was a reference to the number of uh, paid officials, or rather there was a, a reference to the lack of elected officials or so something like that, something that would have implied a difference in the number of uh, staff members versus elected people working for the union. Um, so that wasn't on the agenda and we challenged the fact that it wasn't on the agenda and it was voted by Congress back onto the agenda and it was actually that vote that caused the first walkout. Um, but there was another one and I can't remember where that one was from that was amended fairly quickly um, and then yeah the infamous 10 and 11. Uh, so motion 10 was, was no confidence and motion 11 was uh, a motion of censure. So when the vote was taken to... And what do we mean by a vote of censure? Uh, it's just a slap on the wrist. It's, yeah. a, it's a telling off. Um, it's a, we don't think he did a great job here. Mm. Um, so the no confidence one did call for, for Sally Hunt's resignation as one item among many. Uh, but the censure motion, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's, it's effectively a toothless motion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, we, we disapprove of what you did. Mm. Um, we're not angry, we're just disappointed. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> a very British motion. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great motion. Um, so, so, yeah, as soon as, as, soon as the, uh, the vote was carried to put the democracy review motion back onto the main agenda, what happened was that... Um, and, and to, to sort of understand this, you need to understand that the UCU Congress takes place with hundreds and hundreds of delegates in an enormous room, um, as I'm sure most trade union con congresses and conferences do. Um, and at the front, there's a sort of stage and at UCU, we have the general secretary, we have the presidents, we have various uh, very senior paid staff sitting at the top. And then in front of them, there are lecterns with microphones where people who want to um, who want to put forward motions or speak against motions have to come up and speak into those microphones. And, and down the side of the hall, there are people um, doing things like taking minutes and counting the votes, because we still vote with, uh, with cards, so you have to stick them up in the air, and sometimes if it's close, they need to be counted. So as soon as uh, the democracy review vote had taken place, everybody who was stood along the side of the hall instantly walked out and they, those were the UCU staff members who were employed doing things like tech and lighting and keeping an eye on things um, and very shortly after that the president um, who is not a UCU member of staff she is a she's an elected representative and a member of UCU said that she was suspending congress and and the whole of the top table including the general secretary also walked out um, and it was it was pretty chaotic uh, for a while um, and we then the delegates from the branches who brought the contentious motions uh, went to talk to representatives from Unite. Um, Sheffield decided to take out the bits of our motion that they objected to because we would still it would still have the substance which was there would be a democracy review and we'd have further opportunities to influence whether or not that talked about the things we wanted to talk about. Um, so we took ours out and, and they were happy with that, but the delegates from the branches who had moved motions 10 and 11 said that they had no mandate from their branch to withdraw their motion, which they didn't. Um, so they therefore couldn't agree any kind of compromise with the Unite reps um, because they were flat out saying these motions cannot be heard. And the delegates quite rightly were saying, well, we can't withdraw them. You know, we, we, they, they've come through the correct channels, they've been mm. voted on in the right way. Um, we, just, we just aren't able to withdraw them, not that they, not that they want to, but, mm. but they just couldn't. Uh, so we were, we were kind of stuck. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, the first day's business was sort of abruptly truncated. Then the second day of, um, of 
conference is, is sector conferences. So UCU looks after higher education, further education, prison education and adult community education. Um, so we split off into those different sections and the second day was actually really great. Mm -hmm. Sector conferences went ahead, business was, business was done um, and that was fine. And then we came back on the third day and we had all sorts of, you know, should we vote on whether or not we should vote on whether or not we should vote on these motions? You know, it got really meta um, <laughs> and very frustrating. And there was lots of um, fairly unnecessary debate, I, I, would, have, I would have said, um, different statements coming from, from Unite and from the UCU staff. And repeatedly, over and over again, Congress voted to hear those motions. Um, and over and over again, <laughs> they were not going to be heard. So uh, it, at the end, it, it finished sort of pretty chaotically. Uh, another suspension by the president, um, who then left. Uh, she only has power under the standing orders to suspend for 30 minutes. Um, and after those 30 minutes had happened, instead of her coming back to say, Congress business is concluded, we're, we're getting no further here. Uh, instead, they sent in one of the very senior staff members from UCU, um, I can't even remember precisely which one, <laughs> um, possibly the head of higher education, and um, and he formally said Congress business is concluded, um, and then left again. And by this point, um, lots of the delegates were pretty frustrated. Mm. Uh, there was a bit of booing, um, and then there were attempts to. Uh, basically continue in some way and to yeah. achieve something mm. from the sort of chaos that had had just happened um, so a lot a lot of the remaining delegates got together and organized um, a statement uh, that people could sign up to if they were still there and this is this is a thing that's become known as our UCU um, there's a blog there's a Twitter there's that kind of thing and it was it was a very simple statement that basically said we think that these motions were brought democratically and they should have been heard and you know we reject the actions of the leadership that kind of thing um but by that point i think i think it would be fair to say that everybody who was there regardless of whether they supported the leadership or not was feeling pretty stressed out and it was a fairly uh it was a fairly horrible experience really mm -hmm. um just to 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 see what should be a democratic process breakdown like that in front of you and to see sort of um to have to have those kind of discussions in a way that, that pits you against people that you're used to working with quite closely was difficult so so that that's sort of congress itself as concisely as i can mm. manage yeah um but yeah it was it was difficult yeah and it always is isn't it i mean it's, it's all well and good to talk about you know holding holding officials to account holding these people to account but at the same time, it, it's not easy because, as you said, you know, these are the people that we, as as members and as officials, people work together very closely and often support each other in a million different ways. So it's not nice to then also have that confrontational discussion. Um, so I can I can totally appreciate that. I mean, I mean, how much how much support was there for Sally Hunt on the ground? Because I mean, it did sound like there was very little. Um, that's a, that's a good question, actually. I think um, I mean, an overwhelming majority of delegates. Uh, wanted to hear those motions. Yeah. My feeling is that if they had been, if motions ten and eleven had been heard in the in the usual way, I think she would have won the no confidence vote. Mm. I don't think that there were enough angry people to have voted that through. Yeah. I think the no, I think the censure motion would have passed because mm. I think there was a majority for that. Um, she she has some support from delegates. She did, um, but there were also. Uh, I know for a fact that there were a lot of delegates there who wouldn't have voted for the no confidence motion, but who were then outraged by the walkout. And so um, probably would now. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah precisely that. Um, you know, so so they were voting, and in all the subsequent votes that we took about whether or not we should hear these motions, um, those people were coming in and voting to hear them because mm. because you know they felt that uh, the will of Congress had been um, had been overridden, um, and they they were angry about that. Mm. But, well, because it's such a central part of trade unionism, isn't it, that, that the voice of Congress or conference is sacrosanct, mm -hmm. that the conference decides the direction, conference is, is the heart of the union, and everything else follows on from that. Yeah. Um, and so to see staff overriding like that is, you know, as I was talking about earlier, is it, for me, from, coming from a position of being an official, 
I couldn't even imagine even daring to think about it, let alone do it. You know, <laughs> just it's a terrifying prospect, you know, and not a good one. Um, I mean, this is a very difficult question to answer. So if you can't answer, then fair enough. But what is what? What are her motivations? Do you think? Because I know that's very difficult to answer, but. <laughs> Tell us about Sally Hudson. Yeah, I mean, obviously, no one has an insight to this person's brain and their psychology and their, their personality. But, but guess. Yeah. <laughs> Try but this, anyway. This is someone who has twice fundamentally underestimated their own power, right? Their own power base has seemingly no strategic thinking at all. You, you're right. I, that's what I've heard as well, that she probably would have won those two votes I mean yeah maybe lost the vote to censure but closely lost um, and I don't think there was a people were unhappy with the outcome of the strike I don't think there was a great deal of bitterness between against her particularly at that point but then the actions of conference have just absolutely undermined and destroyed any possible goodwill that she might have had a kind of a latent level so what is motivating these actions is it just a leadership completely detached from its membership is it that she was never a lecturer she, she doesn't understand these issues what do you think is going on here behind this lack case? of confidence maybe yeah i think yeah i wonder i wonder whether it's whether it's as straightforward as and i'm sure it's not but i mean no, nobody wants to sit in front of 500 people and be slated right you, you don't mm. want that to happen you don't want to be publicly criticized and i think that as as a leadership um not just sally but you know uh, the UCU leadership broadly defined, I think probably probably feeling quite defensive about the the ACAS rejected deal in the first place, probably feeling very defensive about the fact that the um, the meeting that effectively ended the dispute um, was so contested and then so publicly contested. I think they they've been quite slow to come to terms with the um, the uh, the activity of members on social media. Mm. Um, I think they weren't expecting that. You know, UCU's official social media presence is is not not a hot usually. Um, whereas we've got thousands of members mm. who have thousands of Twitter followers who've been on it for years because their employer told them to, which is a beautiful um, <laughs> a beautiful element of why that's happened. That's an, an insight that I owe to my my colleague Joe Grady. So I'm going to give her credit for that. Um, but but yeah, I think I think. I think um, I think Sally probably um, probably also knew that when the walkout happened, there would then be an opportunity to spin it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and she has access, obviously, to the whole membership in a way that a lot of the grassroots activists don't. You know, we mm -hmm. have to create our own networks, our own mailing lists, our own ways of of contacting people. Um, and the email that she sent to all members talking about what happened at Congress um, was, uh, I think, I'm just going to come out and say it, it was infuriating. Mm. It, it made me so angry the way that she uh, she accused us of bullying staff, basically said that staff had ended up in tears because of, you know, and what, while it should be fairly straightforward to say, no, we just wanted to hold you to account, on another level, you've just lied about me to thousands of people. Mm. Um, and that's while you're being denounced in the Morning Star as ultra-left tactical insanity. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, that I, I did laugh at that. It was, my, it was my Twitter bio for a while. But... Um, <laughs> But yeah, the the whole thing I think I think lack of strategy, um, and I think you're spot on that she's underestimated underestimated the power of membership completely, um, and it just played out very very badly. Um. So according to sources that we we've, we've spoken to, that letter that was supposedly penned by the Unite branch of UCU staffers, um, from what we heard, it never actually was agreed by the staff branch. So um, it was actually just written by those at conference. They put a Unite branch on it. Um, was this clear on the day or did it lead to, um, or were you led to believe differently or? Um, I mean, pretty much nothing was clear on the day. Um, I think it would be fair to say that we were told that we would be talking to Unite reps to talk about the wording of these motions. So at that point, you know, fair enough, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're negotiating with a rep. Mm -hmm. um, had no reason to, 
want to publicly suggest mm -hmm. uh, that that might not have been a, a an agreed out branch decision and then afterwards you know people leak emails you talk to people that you know and unite um and the whole thing is is still it's still fairly murky from my point of view um and i haven't tried to dig into it too closely if i'm honest um but it i mean it it was it was fairly ridiculous um once you start to consider that the only motion that directly re referred to any member of staff who wasn't sally hunt was our democracy review motion which we changed mm -hmm. um at that point Sally Hunt, obviously she is an employee, her employer is the National Executive Committee, you know, she's, there's no sort of, it, it didn't make sense as a trades dispute, you know, mm. not really. And there was a, a very funny tweet about her negotiating with herself, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's Spider-Man meme. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, um, but I think, obviously, everyone was very clear that Unite have a right to organise mm. how they want to organise, and if you give us a rep, we'll talk to a rep, yeah. but... Um, but yeah, it was nothing was clear at the time. What's it like with staff now? Um, well, I mean, the, the staff that I mostly talk to is our branch administrator, mm. who's a wonderful woman, um, and relationships there totally fine on a, on a local level. Um, I hilariously am on a training course at the moment called UCU Transformed, uh, which is being led by the ex-head of National Bargaining. Um, so I went down to London for a weekend to learn about leadership from him. Um, <laughs> And oh, it was um, it was it was very interesting actually. It was it was a very interesting weekend, um, and I think it would be fair to say that everyone's being civil. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to have a recall congress that will talk about the motions that we couldn't talk about because of the walkout that's happening in October. Uh, so I guess Great. it's going to be a watch this space for what happens then. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a good opportunity to talk about. The future, as you see. Nice, nice smooth. Yeah. <laughs> it's like professional. Only after one episode so, as well. Yeah, well that we'll, level of professionalism. Oh, we've, we've nailed it now. I've got this podcast job down. <laughs> um, I uh, obviously I'm interested in, uh, in organising education as a as a school teacher. Uh, when UCU Rank and Vol Revolt, which is uh, I, I should maybe explain, is an initiative that came out as a result of these disputes. Um, there's several of those, and we can talk a little bit about each one of them. But uh, they held a meeting in Sheffield, um, which I was able to go along and observe, and there was some really exciting stuff being discussed there. Uh, one interesting thing, actually, was the one thing that was not discussed at that meeting was pensions. I think it's interesting, a lot of people were kind of feeling that the pension thing, although it was important to prepare for that upcoming battle, wasn't really the priority right now that actually it's about changing the union so it's able to fight those battles mm. so it's able to win those battles in a substantial way and also take on more issues which is going to hopefully boost the levels of participation so there was discussions of casualization about young workers and the difficulty of um, climbing the ladder in academia um, and there was a lot of discussion about the role of university and communities as well which is a very exciting area to look at and the way that you see you can link up with other trade unions within universities but also within communities as well so yeah I, w I was interested to know what you saw the next steps potentially being uh, whether any of these rank and file movements have could potentially play that transformative role that you've already talked about the UCU um, and whether there is another sort of round two on the horizon when it comes to the USS pensions dispute other than ultra left <laughs> yeah. tactical insanity, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the uh, the rank and file networks that have grown up are absolutely really exciting, and the the leadership training that I just referred to clashed with that Sheffield meeting. Otherwise, it would absolutely have been there. It's interesting choices I've made there. Um, <laughs> don't, don't hold it against me, but um, but yeah, I think. Um, that there's been different levels of organising within UCU for years. Um, there's there's factions broadly defined. Um, I don't think rank and file counts as a faction at this point because it's very new and it's a very different kind of um, has different kind of goals and aims than the the longer established ones do. Um, but I think it's I think it's a very exciting example of um, what can happen uh, given 
the right kinds of organising, um, for sure. And I know that there's considerable overlap with people who are involved in the rank and file stuff who are also involved in other initiatives around UCU. Um, so the links between people who have been uh, organising for a long time and these newer uh, newer groups um, are, are well established already. I think that there's also um, stuff going on that is is explicitly to do with um, information dissemination and transparency, uh, less to do with traditional labour organising and more to do with empowering members to actually know what's happening. Um, because it can be incredibly difficult at a branch level and I guess, well, certainly at a national level to, to communicate openly about how negotiations work and especially when you're dealing with a complicated mm -hmm. dispute like a pensions dispute. Um, so there's all sorts of work going on around that as well and lots of members who are blogging and writing stuff and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I feel very optimistic at the moment that, um, that there are sufficient numbers of young, new or newly energised um, and that's a sort of Venn diagram where there's overlap, but, um, you know, lots of people who want to get stuck in, in a way that perhaps they didn't 18 months ago, um, which is fantastic. And I think, I think we can do all sorts of great things from there, really. Well, I hope we can anyway, because not only have we got the USS dispute ongoing, we've got, we're about to be balloted over pay, um, which is going to happen. The ballot will open next month um, and close in October. Um, and if the offer is rejected, then we'll be looking at industrial action in November again. So, mm. so there is a lot going on. So it's rolling action in many ways. Yeah, yeah. That the, the USS is obviously that will be revisited, but there will be yeah. further actions in the university. Well, so so the the joint expert panel is due to report in September, mm. um, and whatever is reported on that will um, will dictate the next direction of the USS dispute. But if there's then a sort of parallel pay dispute, I mean, who knows where we go from there, really? But um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's safe to say that uh, I mean, and we've talked almost exclusively about the USS dispute, and I yeah, talk I want to talk very very quickly about um, what's happening in further education mm. at the moment, which is just you know redundancies just coming absolutely from everywhere, and the the fight back that has been happening in further education uh, that UCU is supporting nationally. Um, that's going on as well. There's there's action all over the place, and there's been some really significant wins in different parts of the country on that. Um, so broadly, I think, despite the fact that Congress was an absolute shit show, excuse my language, um, <laughs> UCU has had an amazing year, one way or another. Um, we we might have liked to see a different uh, end to the USS dispute, but regardless. Um, the, the increase in membership has been incredible mm. locally, nationally, across the board it's just, mm. it's a really great moment and we need to capitalise on it In terms of um, sort of thinking about things that are replicable or replicable to other unions technology played a very interesting role in, in this mobilisation mm. so you already mentioned that social media was used as quite a powerful tool to link up the membership in ways that maybe they wouldn't be able to contact each other. I remember seeing uh, during that time when the first offer was being discussed, was, I remember seeing the, the picture for the Sheffield meeting on Twitter and it being blown away, but also seeing that people would set up a, a Google Docs, I think it was, where they were sharing their votes from the meetings, as I understand it. And that was a really powerful way of connecting up branches in a way that would have been mediated by the leadership previously. Mm. So I wonder if you felt that technologies played a particular role here, how useful they were, were there any drawbacks or limitations to those kind of things? Yeah, I think I think there's um, there's a temptation to say Twitter is going to save us, Twitter is the organising tool, it's, it's absolutely not, like it's, it's, a, it's a great communication tool, it's not any kind of substitute for an actual meeting or a face-to-face -face conversation. I think, I think you have to harness the power of social media and use that to feed into whatever it is you're actually doing in the real world. Mm. Um, that's, you know, um, I think I think what you said about the Google Docs is, is really important. Um, there was a, a group Twitter DM chat among branches that just enabled us to talk uh, in a way that, you know, we, we, I mean, 
the, the UCU national website is one of the worst websites I've ever seen and the staff <laughs> freely admit that you know it's, it's a dreadful website and there, there's a load of information on it but you just can't find it mm. and if you can do that quickly through a hashtag or a google doc or, or whatever um, well, then that's, there. yeah yeah mm. exactly exactly um, and that's again going back to this openness and transparency thing um, that is just something that members are, are completely pushing for and that might in turn change how we hold meetings or what kind of meetings we hold um, but I think yeah for me for me technology is is huge obviously social media in particular but I don't ever want to be in a in a situation where um, you know you're relying on that for your organizing you know it's it needs to, it needs to go hand in hand with the rest of it I think. well one thing that I was particularly interested in is um, I, I always think that the, the role of factions is actually it's a really interesting thing because you know in a lot of ways it's a massive positive because it, it does activate people you know they, they, they bring people out they get people involved in elections but you know they can also be a massive they can also be a massive uh, roadblock to change um, so you know I, I, I always have a split split uh, perspective on it you know I, I think I see the positives and the difficulties as well but what sort of role do you see the the role of those factions having in the future of, of UCU and, and, and bringing through this change well that's a good question because one of one of the the so we have two main factions we should have asked you which one you no, were that's in first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have two for the benefit of, of people who've mm. um who don't follow union internal politics. We have the independent broad left, who broadly speaking support Sally, and I would argue have a far, uh, far more small c conservative approach to organising. Mm -hmm. And then we have UCU left, um, which uh, is um, which is the sort of the the opposition to the IBM. I think the I think. names in themselves are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> broad left and left. <laughs> broad, uh, yeah, yeah. I was I was in a meeting once, and, and somebody said this was a UCU left member she said when she joined UCU she thought it was astonishing that you would need to join a faction that said it was on the left of a trade union because mm. aren't trade unions you know intrinsically mm. on the left and at that the entire room cracked up <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know I think I, th I think factions for me the one of the problems with factions is um is communicating about them to the layer of membership that, that don't take an interest mm. in that. I think they can be intimidating. Yeah. I think they can be uh, they can be all sorts of things. And and the fact that um, that factional communication can often get quite nasty. You know, yeah. that's that's why the Morning Star are denouncing us and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> it. And you have to be sort of good humoured about it. But I think it's it's best not to to focus on it when you're trying to um, when you're trying to engage people who haven't previously been engaged. I guess yeah. so. I. I I think that there is a lot of expertise in, in activists uh, who've, who've been involved in factions, but I think the, the links to the sort of the newer networks and the newly engaged members, you know, that needs to be carefully handled and, and bring it all together. Yeah. Okay. Um, just, to, just to finish off on a very broad question, but I'm interested on, in your take on it. We, we live in a very changing world technologically, socially, economically, and uh, as an educator, it's very difficult to anticipate what the world is going to be like in two, three, five years time. Obviously, pensions and pay is an outcome of the cuts to universities, cuts to education. Is this going to be a question about space communism? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> I wasn't sure, I wasn't, well, well that could be, space <laughs> communism could be your answer. Um, what, what I'm interested in is, what do you see the university of five or 10 years time what are there going to be the issues that are fought over? What is that university going to be looking like? Is access, for example, going to be a problem again we, in terms of education getting more and more expensive? What do you foresee as the kind of the issues that are arising within the next five, ten years? I'm going to be completely honest and say that I cannot see past the next general election and I want yeah. Jeremy Corbyn in government and I will worry about <laughs> the rest of it later, yeah. um, which is on one level an absolute cop out of an answer. But on another level, having watched over the last 10 years, mm. the systemic cuts to every part of education in this country mm. you know it makes me so angry and I think in the in the very short term so I guess that's over the next four or five mm. years isn't it I think everybody who works in education should be getting out there and fighting 
uh, for a Labour government mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know we'll worry about the rest of it after that's happened mm -hmm. because we have to get the Tories out yeah and I think I, you know you're talking about redundancies in, in colleges you know you look at all you need to do is look at whole college we've yeah. seen a third of staff yeah. got rid of a third of yeah. staff something like 400 people put our work I, I was in a in a health and safety training course with colleagues from FE and one of the safety reps said we've had a real issue with UTIs, urinary tract infections, and I looked at her and I couldn't quite understand why that would, you mm. know, and she was like, we don't have time to go to the toilet, okay. and I was just like, Jesus. Yeah, you get yeah. it in primary school teachers, it's, there's a really, really high incidence of it as well. It's horrific. I know, yeah. it's crazy. Um, so yeah, we have to fight this. Okay. Well, we have reached that time in the podcast. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't thought of another sound. Well, I was going to pass it over to you. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> pass the buck over and say, Dave, would you like to close the podcast? I don't, I don't know. What, what should we go for this time? I, I did, but I mean, I enjoyed the cookie one mm. last time. It was really good. What's some other stereotypical ones that news reporters end on? Is it thank, thank you and good luck or something? Yeah. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should go with that with uh, the with D the Donald. The Donald <laughs> joining us. This yeah, it's it. Oh yeah, it's it's very on point. It's very on point. Timely, yeah. current. The timely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, God bless America. Obviously, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna end like that. Yeah, okay. All right. Bye. bye. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for listening to Talking Shop a podcast by New Syndicalist for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes through subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas, or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.